It's comics are great. Comics are great. The visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics dot a a d l dot org, and this is the show where we talk with cartoonists about making comics, about the comics we love, storytelling, visual storytelling, uh, the lifestyle of a cartoonist. And my name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And I'm going to, before I introduce the guests, I'm going to talk about the topic today. We're recording the show October 30th, 2013. So it's the day before Halloween, or as some people like to call it, Devil's Night. And uh, I think uh, a topic that's on a lot of people's minds is, besides going and dressing up as a sexy witch uh, at parties, <laughs> uh, people are thinking about what kind of scary stories am I going to read with my friends, or what kind of scary movies am I going to watch, what kind of like you know horror-themed things am I going to be particip participating in this weekend, uh, or this, this holiday. Uh, and so... I, as a guy who scares easily and doesn't go to a lot of scary movies, uh, not the expert you want to go to on that. So I brought in a couple of experts, a couple of guys who think a lot about scary stuff uh, and are adept at communicating visually with scary stuff. And I'll start with uh, Eric Orchard returning to the show, Inky Bat on Twitter. Hey, Eric. Hi. Hey, Jersey. So great to be back. It's great to meet you, John, finally. Nice to meet you, too, Eric. Thanks. Uh, Eric Orchard of ericorchard.blogspot.com. Your la the last time you were on the show was 30 episodes ago, episode 57. Uh, comicsagreat.com slash CAG57. We talked about scary stories for kids, if I'm not mistaken, yeah? That was a while ago. Oh, did we lose Eric's video? <laughs> and Eric gives us a pensive thought as I, as I talk about how long it's been. Oh, hey, there you are, Eric. Oh, we lost him. <laughs> this show is already off the rails, and we just started. So while we wait for Eric to come back, I'll turn to John David Guerra. Hope I'm saying it right. Yeah. Of NightmareProWrestling.com, another guy who uh, deals in uh, scary imagery, uh, so scary and fun imagery, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, also the author of the new comic that just came out called The Ghost King, a digital comic people can get on Gumroad, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to do, actually. Yeah, well, let's talk about Ghost King before we talk about Nightmare for Wrestling real quick. Sure. Um, it's about a young kid that's haunted by 13 ghosts, and he uses them to go on adventures. Um, the goal is to actually make, like, 13 issues to go inside with the ghosts. But uh, the first issue has two ghosts, so I'm going to have to try to fix that some way. <laughs> I don't know. One of the ghosts comes back for revenge. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but my favorite, I, I bought the book, and I, I recommend everybody go out and do it. I mean, it's it's dirt cheap. Uh, what is it, like 99, 99 cents? Oh, it's pay what you want, right? It's 99 cents and uh, pay what you want. Pay what you want. And I, I, I recommend more, but, you know, 99 cents, you can't, you can't beat that. Uh, my favorite character is this bird that is like a repository for all of their... <laughs> magical items and he barfs them out <laughs> yeah. i mean the fifth grader in me was delighted by this how cool is that <laughs> to have a magical bird that barfs out weapons for you i uh, i figured he needed like a some sort of like magical hat or something to keep all his magic stuff in and then i thought like wouldn't it be funny if his familiar just like swallowed everything and you know yeah. kept all his magic stuff and weapons that's pretty cool. And then, and then Nightmare Pro Wrestling is another comic that, a webcomic you've been doing for a long time now. Yeah. Uh, super, super fun book. Uh, Grave, the main character, I think has one of the most fun designs ever, and I couldn't resist uh, <laughs> sketching him a while back. But what's Nightmare Pro Wrestling about? Um, it's about a young monster uh, named Grave and uh, his tag team partner Lobo as they grow to become better wrestlers and have fun doing it. Um, Lobo is like a cowardly werewolf, so that affects like uh, a lot of their matches at times. <laughs> uh, and uh, really, really fun action, like intensity, and but like good comedy and great character moments, and uh, it's just it's it's a blast to read. So that's nightmare, nightmareprowrestling.com. dot com. Thanks. Uh, and and you're a, a new father again. Yes. <laughs> So, I mean, you've been posting uh, pictures of your daughter on Facebook, uh, but uh, one of the things you talked about... I've become one of those dads, yeah. <laughs> Eric, are you there? I am. Oh, okay. We don't have I, your video. I, I, yeah, my video went dead for a second. Well, I'm not seeing it at all still. Oh, I can see myself. I can see you guys. Do you want to turn your camera off and on real quick? Sure. Hold on. Why don't we try to get you back? 
With, okay. Yeah, it's thinking about it. Skype's doing a little spinny thing. Ah. But uh, you guys are both dads. And, uh, oh, there we go. We got Eric back. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, and before we dive into the topic, I just want to, like, cause John and I were talking before we started streaming about, like, because, like, I read these blog posts by cartoonists who are parents, and they talk about, like, how their life changes. And as a guy who's, like, skirted around the idea of, like, maybe I'll have a kid. I don't know. I'm not getting any younger. And then I read one of those blog posts and go, like, oh, that's how little you sleep? Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, but, John, you had some thoughts on, like, like diving in and being more intentional in your work. That's what really changes, right? Right. Yeah. Um, like, my daughter sleeps, like, a straight three hours. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, three hours. Let's see how much work I can get done. Go! <laughs> Does that jive with you, Eric? Yeah, um, I, I just sort of I can I can work with the house burning down. I'm really <laughs> blessed with this ability to work no matter what, and 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 so I think for me, I've barely noticed a difference between being a parent and a non-parent. Uh, I, I think I you know there are those periods. I was holding I was holding Thomas, my my new son, newest son, for a good hour while he, while he cried. So you get a little, the, the frustration levels are higher. Uh, <laughs> you get a thicker skin to the, for the frustration. And I'm, I'm hearing yeah. your bird in the background too, your recently adopted bird. Yeah. We found a bird in the, uh, in the back garden. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been, you've been uh, posting pictures online too of, of uh, this bird who's taken over your life. And, and, yeah, Albert uh, Pineapple. What is his name? Albert Pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're familiar. Uh, so, okay, well, let's dive into topic then. Uh, so much then for, you know, parenting and animal adoption, but scary stories. You know, what makes a story scary? And my first, well, I've got a squishy question for you guys, but before we get to the squishy question, I want to uh, dig at, you know, just a celebratory way. You know, people are thinking about scary stories right now, and as guys who spend a lot of time drawing this stuff, I'm sure you have some examples of haunting scenes. Start with just scenes that stick with us. There are stories where one moment happens in the story, and even if we haven't read the story or watched the story in 20 years, it sticks with us. You know, um, I talked with Tom Cito, uh, animation guy from uh, Disney and Filmation, and he said that you know one of the powers of visual storytelling is when you think of the the, the book Moby Dick, you don't think of Call me Ishmael. One day when I was feeling such and such, I went down to the sea. You think of that scene of Ahab stabbing the heck out of that whale. It forms an image that haunts you. And uh, with scary stories, there's these moments that are just, they, they grip us, they hit us like a, like, a, like a freight truck. And we, you know, even years later, think about them. So I'm wondering if you guys have some examples, just to start off with, to get, get the conversation going, like of really haunting moments from film, comics, literature that stick with you to this day. Well, I can't stop thinking, as, the whole time you were talking, I'm thinking of the first time you see the house in Night of the Living Dead. And it's just... It still scares me if I think about it too much. And, and I, think, I think to me, uh, place is really important in a spooky story. To me, it's almost everything. Um, more than it's, it's, it's as important as the monster is because the monster either complements or contrasts to the place. And, uh, you know, like, man, that, that spooky, burnt out old building that, that they hole up in, Night of the Living Dead, scariest thing in the world to me. Wow. We were just talking about that before we started streaming, John, about like this idea of like, for some reason, you can turn down the lights in like a candy store or make it like greenlit and suddenly it's not so comfortable there. Uh, do you agree about place then, John? What was that? Do, do, you agree, do, does, do you concur with this idea about place? Like, do you have any places oh, that in... Yeah, definitely. Uh, atmosphere plays like a, a big part in it. Um, I think I brought this up last time I was on the show, so forgive me if I'm, I'm repeating myself, but... Uh, uh, what I started thinking of was like, um, there's a movie called the uh, the Woman in Black in Black with Daniel Radcliffe in it. Yeah. There's there's like a scene where he hears or kind of like sees something like at the end of this like shadowy hallway, and all he has to uh, light his way is like this uh, candle. Mm -hmm. So you know you're he's slowly walking down like this hallway, and you can kind of see something, but not really, you know. And you're just kind of like just waiting for it, you know. The tension starts to build, you know, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, also, I think like like uh, the first thing that popped into my head was uh, the first time I saw the ring, and I know like uh, J. Har at that time was like something new, 
So it was like this unnatural sort of like movement and like appearance of like the girl coming out of like the TV and how uh, unsettling that was. Cause it was like this new kind of horror that, you know, like uh, us over here weren't really used to. And uh, that kind of like atmosphere, like around that, like uh, uh, there's like this uh, filter of green almost like a, on all of those scenes, like where she would come out, you know? Yeah, and even when they find that first, uh, I've never finished uh, the ring. <laughs> I got to the part where they find the girl in the closet, and uh, that was where I was like, "All right, I'm out." <laughs> and, and did I mention that I was at a barber shop when I was watching it? And I was like, "Why are you playing this in a barber shop? You got sharp things next to my head, and you're playing this movie in front of me." I was like, "Put on some cartoons," but um, yeah, they find this girl in the closet, and like she's all like greenish too, with that horrified look on her face. Uh, yeah. Uh, but 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 place like the Amityville house, right? The Amityville horror, that house. Whenever I see houses that look like that, I hear those little girls singing, and I'm like, Ugh. oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you're reminding me of uh, this quote, I, and I can't. I'll have to paraphrase, but it's, it's Guillermo del Toro, and he talks about how the difference between being scared in a situation and it being a normal situation. It's like the flip of a switch. It's like something can be totally normal, but it just takes a few off things to make you totally queasy and weird about it you know <laughs> and, and you're both sort of referring to that thing it's it's it, it's like the weird movements in the ring i totally know what you're talking about it's like man it's just feels off you know yeah. and then um you know the the uh the you know that that uh, if you you saw the daniel radcliffe movie the one in black uh, it, you saw that house during the day and it was all lit up totally different atmosphere it's so it's so interesting how it's it's like a checklist of things that make it creepy, you know. <laughs> you gotta add some fog, you know. Yes. You make the house a little deteriorated, you know, untaken care of. Yeah, I th I think what you guys are digging at, if I'm not mistaken, is this idea that it has to because like. You know, I just did a class, uh, I teach comics classes in Ann Arbor, and we just did a session on monsters, and like, what makes a monster? You know, and like, one of the things that the students, and I, I put it on them, you know, let's let's start, you know, uh, collecting some ideas on what we think makes monsters, and this recurring idea came in that it has to be just human enough, just human enough that it's rational and reasonable, but it has to be just off human enough and i think about like what what dawn on me is like my irrational fear of ventriloquist dummies i'm like that's it you know they're just enough to say that this is a person but they're just distorted enough that i go ah i don't like looking at that uh mannequins creep me out too for the same reason you know it's like a yeah, the uncanny valley of Matt's piping into the into the audio <laughs> feed right it's like yeah it's that that idea and like so locations can have uncanny valley right maybe that's a good question. I have never, I've never ever considered it in those terms, but yeah, I can see that. You know, it's like it's home, but it's not home. You yeah, know? I see what you mean. I see what you mean. You've sort of you've taken away the comfort of it. You're yeah. you're teetering on the edge of a sort of a void of uncertainty, whereas you were totally safe a moment ago. It's yeah. horrifying. <laughs> or take away something that you're used to seeing that you see like normally every day, and then just like distort it just like a little bit where it just. You know, it's not something that's strange to you now because you haven't seen it as, as often. Oh, we're getting some slap back from you, John. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, just lean back. We're not going to reflect off you as much. Oh, we're still getting it. Now I'm not sure who it's coming from. Um, if both of you could lean back from the monitor because you're using your computer mics. There we go. Hello, hello, hello. There we go. Yeah, it, it, our voices are bouncing off of our chests and coming back at the internal mics on our computers. So uh, Physics. Yes. <laughs> or massive chests. <laughs> well, in your case, John, yes. Anybody see those arms? He could kill me with his bare hands. Yet another man who can kill me with his bare hands. Wrestling arms. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Eric, you were saying, I'm sorry. Another example of that is Neil Gaiman's Coraline where with the other parents, man, that is like yeah. the freakiest idea. And, and yeah, it's so interesting the way you just change the eyes and it's like, they're the most horrifying thing ever. So, oh, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Actually Coraline was where it was like just getting to the edge of, I don't know if I can continue to watch this. It's getting a little too creepy. And it was those freaking button eyes on the parents and they're, they're acting and talking perfectly normal. 
Uh, and I think I think that this kind of like speaks to dream logic a little bit because I remember as a kid having nightmares about like oh my gosh there's gremlins in the house right the gremlins from like the Steven Spielberg movie and they're all over the place and I could see them but my parents won't recognize that they're there and my mom looks at me and she smiles very pleasant like oh it's just your imagination and then she gets dragged away by a gremlin you know and like it's horrifying <laughs> because like there's that normalcy and that ab abnormalcy in the same location right yeah. And I think that imagination also plays a big part to like, like how you just said, like your imagination just like feeds those fears, you know, just takes everything that uh, you're afraid of or that you think is like odd and just like enhances it, you know? What about, what about moments that haunt you? Uh, Cause like, I've got things like, uh, you know, the speaking of night of the living dead again, uh, when the woman goes down to the basement mm -hmm. to face her daughter, and and it's this this moment of resignation like i there's no way out i love my daughter she's a monster now i'm gonna go let her take me you know yeah. uh ooh, gives me the creeps every time i think about it <laughs> uh and, and again i've only seen that movie a couple times years ago was the last time i watched it but it's still i think about that moment uh are there any moments like that for you guys that we could pick apart mm. Let's see. Or, or we could go here. I've got personal stories. Uh, when I was a little kid, speaking of mannequins and stuff, when I was a little, little kid, so this would be like the early 80s, I remember going to visit a relative. And this is like the early 80s, so it was still okay for, uh, or it still was stylish to wear wigs. Remember that? Like it was like, it was like a, th a thing that you did. And it was like not weird to wear wigs all the time. And I walked into this relative's uh, bedroom by accident. I was looking for the bathroom. I walked into the bedroom, and she had a bureau of just mannequin heads with all these wigs on it, with these oh, dead wow. faces. And as, like, a four- or five-year-old, it just... And, and plus, the room was all, like, painted, like, dark red. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, everything was wrong with that moment. And I didn't know she was wearing a wig, so I was still a little kid. But all I saw was just these, these blank, dead heads on this bureau with wigs on them. Oh, it still, it still shakes me up. Uh, red room. It turned to like an episode of Twin Peaks. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it totally did. There was a little guy who was talking backwards and walking weird. Uh, but uh, anything like that, that like you think of, like that just grips you from your favorite horror stories. Oh, man. Mm, where to start? Yeah. <laughs> There's so many moments. Um, I mean, right from the beginning, the... Uh, you know, the first horror novel ever written. That, that there's a scene in the first, what's recognized as the first horror novel, which is the house of, a, the castle of, of, of Toronto by Horace Walpole. When someone's praying in church and the person in front of them turns around and it's a skeleton, you know, and it's so goofy, but it kind of gives you a good chill. And I think, I think uh, you know, horror stories from then on have been trying to recapture that. I think that's exactly what you're, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's the moment in uh, the end of Hellraiser 2, right? Where it's like, uh, it, it's all a dream. And then the curtains open, no, it's not, right? It's like, <laughs> we're safe. No, you're not, right? Yeah, that's kind of yeah, like... Yeah. Part Break of... me to hell, that ends like that too. Nightmare on Elm Street, the original one, it also ends like that. Like, oh, everything's happy again. Let's get in this car that has yeah. Freddy Stripes on it. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> so, like... I think of something Joss Whedon once said, uh, and it's something that I try to do in my own writing is just in general is like create like these emotional arcs of everything's okay. And then immediately follow that with something terrible happening, like a trapeze act, like, Oh, I'm on the trapeze. I'm not going to fall after all. Oh my God, I'm going to fall. Oh, I'm on another trapeze. I'm not going to fall. Um, that's part of this whole thing that we're talking about here is like creating like a, a repeating sense of safety and danger or yeah. discomfort. Right. There are a lot of horror movies, though, that don't follow that at all. And it's like always what? like that sense of discomfort all the way through. Like what? Like uh, the, the more like, uh, 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 for lack of a better term, the, the torture porn kind of stuff. Okay, let's go there. <laughs> let's do, so I, I can't sit through those. I'm, I'm, I'm I, Jersey, I can't sit through them either. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Neither can I. Like, uh, I think that's, it's funny because I can watch like, uh, monsters and people with masks like going after people but when it's like real people going after people uh, i think that kind of scares me like a little bit more and becomes a little more disturbing to me yeah we talked about this before when you were on the show john this idea about what's the difference between something that's frightening and disturbing right and i think the like the whole like there was a movie that came out a while back that once i saw the trailer i was like oh, not gonna see that and it was something about home invasion it was like people get oh, I don't remember what the name of the film was. People will correct me on Twitter. Strangers? 
Maybe. Yeah, like in the trailer, it shows them like like the people tired. They're like, why are you doing this? And like it's people with bags in their heads or something. I'm yeah. Like, well, because you're home, you know? I'm like, yeah. oh, that kind of like random violent stuff. And it's yeah. like, I think about like, if I were to put, say, I'm going to pull up a movie screen, guys. We're going to watch a movie together. And I'm like, oh, well, here's a man getting mauled to death by a bear. And it's real. And you're going to be like, no, I'm not watching that. Yeah. But, the, but yeah. then something weird happens when we go, oh, but here's a man getting mauled by a bear. And it's pretend. And then we're like, here's money. Yeah, I'll watch it. That's great. Um, I've never understood the torture porn thing, but it's like it's like a thing. Like people like yeah. to watch it, right? I mean, what's I, I, I'm also wondering if it, it's also turned into like kind of like, um, and I, I don't mean to stray off into this topic, but like being like desensitized. Like after the years, like that strange thing is no longer strange, yeah. so you have to make it even stranger. Well, they've pushed horror so far that it's right, just right. the next logical step, and and it's what people want. It's you know like for now <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I, I saw an article that a friend of mine posted up that uh is the original halloween still scary and that they showed it to a bunch of like kids nowadays and uh that it wasn't scary to them mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, uh i was gonna say mike myers john carpenter is, that, is the carpenter did he direct that i believe yeah. so yeah yeah i mean he always he always talks about how he regrets starting a whole genre with that because that wasn't his intent it was supposed to be just sort of this one-off original thing and started a whole thing of, of slasher films and he kind of he, he doesn't like the slasher film genre it's 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 on original but it's also it's violence for the sake of violence and that's not always really scary it's 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 you know, gross isn't scary do you know what i mean it's yeah, yeah it doesn't uh and i find that's that's where torture porn kind of it's it's not always scary it's just gross like you just yeah, you can't it's that cringe worthy sort of stuff yeah and you're just like uh it's it's uh, shocking right 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 um yeah and that that's that's an interesting thing to chart without like and i'm not trying to make any kind of value judgments here i mean i'm not going to watch it because i'm sensitive to that stuff but what's funny is you guys talk about like oh they have to keep amping it up for the next round because like people get desensitized to it if anything i find i get as i get older i get more sensitive to it uh to even where pacific rim like for me personally was just too dark and too scary uh i was expecting something a little lighter than that um and not to say it's a bad movie it's a great movie i know i'm wrong internet everybody said that it was great <laughs> oh, it, was, it is scary yeah. <laughs> but but uh it's it's funny how yeah like I I think it's, and, and I think this is something you were saying earlier John um, you know after becoming a parent you notice that your tastes changed in right. horror it, uh, we're talking talk about that home invasion movie and yeah. just like that thought now that I have a family of like a home invasion kind of horror movie uh, granted the strangers I personally don't I saw it and I didn't think it was like very good because of the the choices the characters made I'm like. Okay, you have a shotgun, you know, just stay where you are. Why are you running out there, you know? I mean, but anyway, but uh, yeah, just, just a thought now that, like, I have a family and that's a little bit more scarier to me and not as fun scary because I tend to lean more towards, like, the fun scary sort of stuff, you know? What do you mean fun scary? I want to hear from both you guys on this. What does it mean that, because, like, the question naturally comes up. Why do we willingly uh, expose ourselves to things that frighten us? Right, whether it's a roller coaster or it's a scary movie, because I do like some scary movies. Uh, I was thinking about that, like yeah. uh, when when you you uh, you asked to do the podcast, and um, I, I think a lot of it is like uh, the escapist sort of thing, you know, like uh, uh, monsters or like this. Uh, uh, Michael Myers is this crazy like serial killer that can't be killed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't really have a face. He has a mask. Uh, you know, other other horror movies like have monsters. Um, uh, I, I think that's what it is. Like uh, being able like to not. How can I put it? Getting away from the reality of it, where it's real enough in, uh, to enjoy, but not real enough. To take too seriously. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very similar to what I said on the on, on the last show with I was on with Jersey, where I was saying I kind of consider horror to be a part of fantasy, and it's it's you're escaping into this. It's a world. It's a it's a whole world that you're you're stepping into, and that's to me it's not even getting scared is sort of like being scared isn't. It's not like jalapeno peppers. It's not like the purpose isn't the rest for me. It's, it's, I love the atmosphere. I love the trappings of it. 
I love the spookiness. It's why I love Halloween. I love going out and seeing my, you know, my little boy's dressing up like a skeleton. And I love that he's being able to enjoy, you know, that, that side of, of, uh, of aesthetics and, and life. It's just so much fun. And it's that adventure that's also in there, like um, like that, you know, trick or treating. You know, that that adventure of trick or treating. Uh, uh, my favorite horror movie is a uh, Fright Night, uh, the original one from uh, the '80s, and uh, I think that's like a perfect example of like uh, that kind of like spooky adventure because you're like, oh, there's this weird guy next door. What's going on? He's bringing in coffins. Uh oh, he's a vampire. And now he's trying to kill me, you know? I better go find this vampire hunter guy and figure out how we're gonna stop this. Yeah. And you know, that adventure that goes along with that. And then of course you get like a, um, what's his name? Prince Humperdinck from uh, yeah, Prince Bride Brian. as a vampire, you know, <laughs> dancing in a disco to 80s music. I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> But I, I remember some very specific moments of that film and I hadn't seen it probably since the 80s. But one of the things that I remember being really Ups, not upsetting, but upsetting in the good way, right? Like the, the good thrill of horrification uh, is when the boy, he knows that the guy's a vampire and nobody else knows and nobody's going to believe him. And there's this mounting dread of the vampire knows that you know now. And so he comes over and he like talks to the mom and the mom's like, oh, you can come over anytime. And he's like, oh, I've been invited over because a vampire can't come into your house unless they're invited. And the boy knows what that means. There's like this double meaning of that moment of like, oh, it's just this friendly moment between monster and mom. Mom doesn't know it's a monster, but I know it's a monster. And now this one uttering of a line means that he's going to come get me tonight kind of thing. Uh, so, again, it's that blending of the familiar and the off, right? Right. And then there's also like their transformation into the vampires where it's, it's not like just like a guy with fangs. It's actually like distorted mouth, almost like bat like, you know, kind of look where it is actually like more frightening than, uh, you know, your usual like vampire, you know, uh, extra detail, like on the, on his features and stuff like that. I remember uh, when I was younger, I used to be terrified of, uh, the scene with the girl, like where she gets like, turns into a vampire. She has just that big smile on her face with yeah. fangs. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, so I'm reading a, I'm yeah. reading a book right now, which was a, a contemporary. Call, it's called the Woman in the Woman in Black, and it's not the one you're thinking of. It's a contemporary novel of uh, Dracula from ni- around late Victorian, early Edwardian, and and man, like the vampires back then, it was just it, it was all about sex. Things have really changed, and that. The, back then, you can look at it. You can see they were they were going into psychology in a way that maybe is a little more hidden now, too, mm-hmm. which is interesting. It's so like even Nosferatu, not just like the the sexy Bella Lugosi Dracula, uh-huh. but like even like because like Nosferatu, uh, yeah, he's pretty monstrous looking. On Max Shrek, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, one of the <laughs> favorite movie monsters ever. Um, and I think the uh, the uh, the original Dracula from the book was sort of uh, there was something sort of monstrous about him. He was sort of animal like. He was hairy and manly. He wasn't. Uh, he, he was somewhere between Nosferatu and uh, and Bela Lugosi, I guess. Hmm. I want I want to talk about monsters for a second. Then, like, okay, what? Because I'll I'll pitch the question to you guys that I pitched at my my kids. Uh, what what makes a good monster? What are some of your favorite monsters, and why are they so memorable? Uh, like I think of like the creature with the eyeballs in its hands from Pan's Labyrinth. That scene where the little girl's trying to get away from that thing, and what really compelled me about that moment was first the mounting tension of he's going to get her. To the rules, there's rules at play. Don't touch the food, and then. Once you do, he's going to get you, but he can't move that good. So you still got a chance, but if you screw up, he's going to get you, right? Uh, and then in, in, introduce that, that gory scene where he eats the fairy and it's all gross, but, uh, <laughs> which for some reason I'm totally okay with in that context. But if, if that had been a person, right, then I'd be like, oh, I don't like this. But anyway, so like, like a, a good monster, what, what can, we, can we find a way to characterize a good monster based oh. on example? For me, like one example of what makes a good monster is, is, a, is a sense of sympathy. Like you, you sympathize with the monster to some degree, which makes them all the more horrible. Like the Thin Man, I think his name is the Thin Man from, uh, from Pan's Labyrinth. Mm-hmm. You know, he couldn't, he was, 
thin and horrible. And he could, you know, he was just sort of like, there was something sad about his, his continents, which made him all the more horrific to me. And that's true. And he's sitting in front of like this ridiculous banquet, but he's all emaciated, right? Exactly. It's like the, the embarrassment of riches, but he can't enjoy it kind of thing. Yeah, I didn't make that connection. Yeah, they, monsters, good monsters are never one dimensional evil. There's always something r rich about it. I really think it's also like for me, um, there has to be like some kind of like uh, limitation. Like he can be beatable, but he, he might not be beat, you know? Um, cause then like, uh, where are the, where are the stakes in that? Like, okay, I I'm going to die. Like no matter what, you know, if he's just like this giant evil godlike creature, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, uh, like creature from the black lagoon is probably like one of my favorite monsters, you know, uh, just like his design is like really cool. But if you think about him monster wise, he's not very powerful. <laughs> you know what I mean? He looks scary. Uh, he'll take your girl. Uh, <laughs> You know, just got to be careful with those claws or like, um, I, I, I think I, I like monsters that are, that really like look cool, but aren't like too superhuman. Another favorite is like Predator. And I think he's a little bit more like sci-fi, but, um, you know, uh, super strong on this world. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger tries his best, you know, and at the end, uh, he kind of wins, but, but not really at the same time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I think that is really important. Like the the look of the monster is so important to me. Well, you guys are both visual storytellers. So let's talk about the visuals that you choose, right? Um, because I think about you know I, I I broke it down in my mind into like these like this really wide spectrum of you got cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is like got like really abstract designs, really. Um, I don't know, distorted and, and nightmarish, but not very detailed. I mean, in, in, at times you could tell, like, oh, that's just like a painted, like, high school play setting in the background, right? But it's still, it doesn't take away from the disturbing nature of it. And then you go into, like, the hyper, you know, HD, gotta see it in the IMAX theater kind of detail. Um, you know, the, the, those aren't the two only choices, but I'm, I'm trying to think, like, what do you guys think when you're designing your own monsters? Because you guys got very different styles. Like, John, yours is, like, super dynamic and cartoony and kind of Saturday morning cartoon fun, but still scary. Uh, Eric, yours is a little bit more calmer and contemplative and it's got these rich textures on it. And there's a lot of atmosphere with your monsters and their settings. Um, what are you guys thinking about? Uh, John, do you want to go first? What are you guys thinking about when you're designing your monsters? Sure. Um, uh, well, a lot of my inspiration for uh, <clears throat> like my work is like from... Um, like those spooky cartoon shorts, like early, like Disney and like Looney Tunes stuff, you know, like Mickey Mouse in the Haunted House and the Mad Doctor and all of that. And uh, I, I always love those because there's like this, not only like the unnatural movement, but on, on almost like creepy, unnatural like character design, you know? So in, in a lot of my work, I try to push for that, like get a more of a uh, uh, John K. Rennan, stimpy, close up kind of look where it looks a little gross and disturbing or, you get those like in SpongeBob also, you know, the yeah. super close ups and you see like the zits on their face and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. like it'll close in on, on SpongeBob's thumb and like you'll see like how gross his fingernail right. is kind of thing. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, Ren and Stimmy did that a lot too. <laughs> it's um, uh, Richard Corbin uh, who does like uh, some creepy comics and uh, stuff. I, the best way I think to describe it is like kind of like this um, hyper unnatural kind of look where it, looks like a person but there's still something like unnatural about it you know like the gums will be pulled like further back or like the, the the nose will be like elongated a little bit where they still look human but there's just something kind of weird about it and Un i always try to again. design things that way where i'm like okay how weird can i make this guy like how how strange can i make him look or like um i i think where i play more of like a atmosphere and spookiness it's like in nightmare pro wrestling i do some shots where the characters are like in the castle and walking through and i always add like a lot of shadow i put some characters like in the background like ghosts or like monsters to kind of give like that kind of like oh this is a world where there's like monsters walking around and stuff like that you know and ghosts and uh i put like a, a filter of green over it too <laughs> kind of give it like a little bit more spooky kind of a feeling and yeah. uh 
I don't know. I, I think I might have rambled on a little too much. <laughs> no, there's a lot in there. There's a lot, a lot of stuff to unbox in there. But I want to hear from Eric now on, on his, his approach. Oh, gosh. I guess, you know, I read, I love spooky stories. So I'm always reading ghost stories and old horror stories. I love the tradition of, of um, the spooky tradition, you know, the, the, the going way back to the 1800s to before that. And I, I think I'm just pulling from that. I, I, I want to... Um, to me, it's it's like I've. Uh, I, it's hard to say that I'm trying to do anything in particular because I'm so. Uh, you know, I'm 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 I've digested so much of those stories that it just it's naturally what comes out when I draw. It's just it sounds like I'm talking about something else, but it's like. It's like uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're saying that your art is an excretion. You yeah, extrude like, your art. <laughs> well, we're doing horror, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but, but it's just I think I draw in a, in a way that's natural to me and it's natural for me to be exploring that that horror tradition you know Eric's Eric's work is like a like in his uh, marrow bones and uh, uh, what is it Ollie's tomb oh uh, yeah yeah, yeah he, he um, it's very atmospheric like uh, I think I've told him that before <laughs> and it's what I really like about his work where he has like a tendency to uh it makes you feel like it's always like evening, like in a lot of his work, where there's like those, everything's lit by like candlelight and like lanterns and stuff. Yeah. 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 So much. Yeah. There's that magic to it. Yeah, it has, it, has a, it has an atmosphere, and Eric's worlds aren't places where I would expect a cheap jump scare. I feel I feel like it's more of like it's 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 a it's a seasoning is this this kind of creepy off kilter because like I don't want to say that your your stories feel like uh, really frightening like I wouldn't give it to a kid I think it's just the right kind of frightening for a kid where it's like this is a eerie world right like eerie like um, I, I I can't think of another word for it but that I, I guess that's that sums it up for it's me that spooky adventure I was talking about and yeah. that's I like about his work where it's like it's like this little adventure of like hide and go seek, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's better than I could have put it. And it's true. It's it's that's exactly what I'm going for. And and yeah. Whereas I can imagine a jump scare in John's worlds. Right? <laughs> because it's a very dynamic place where all these monsters live and everything is constantly moving. Yeah. But I love this this thought on color too, because both of you guys use what I would call minor key colors. Uh, you know, like I, as a guy who tends to gravitate towards like very primary color palettes for my own work, when I see your stuff, it's like, oh, this is all as if they're playing on the minor keys with all the colors. It's just a little bit off. And like, you know, you talk about greens, but also Eric, you use a lot of this weird pumpkin orange. And I don't want to just say pumpkin orange because that's, that's still too bright compared to what you use. But there's this preponderance of oranges and yellows in your work that adds to that atmosphere. Yeah. I, I, I'm drawn to warm colors and yeah, I find it, uh, it's just, it, it's, it, I, I try to make it, I try to make the palette simple and, um, and I'm also, I also feel more confident as a, as a drawer than I do as a color. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I try to, I, I do, I'm as simple as I can be in, in colors, but, um, yeah, yeah. I think it also like uh, certain colors make us think about like uh, certain things that we recognize. Like uh, like uh, uh, I tend to use like a lot of like fall colors, like green, orange, you know, purples are thrown in there too. Um, and uh, even I, even just like I think like the subtle use of those colors, uh, your mind recognizes it as like oh, this is like a fall kind of time, and yeah. is, but it's kind of spooky, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of feeling. Yeah, that's, some, that's something I try to remind my students of when we're working with comics and color is I say, like, well, green means a lot of things. Green can be the color of life and rejuvenation, a spring day, but green can also be the color of sickness and decay and morbidity and, and things like that. Uh, so it's just knowing those associations that you make. And, you know, people make a big fuss out of color theory, but, I mean, what you pointed out, John, I think, is that really it boils down to what associations do you make with the color? Look at the color. What do you associate it with? That's that's pretty much what you should be doing when you're applying color to your pages, right? Can we talk about kids in horror real quick? You hinted at that earlier uh, when you're talking about the ring, because I want to know what is it about you put a ghost kid yeah. in a story, the changeling with George C. Scott, man. 
you put a kid, a ghost kid in a story, and instantly it's just like 50 times creepier. And as an example, I'm hoping we can pull up some of those images that you've been posting to Facebook, John. Uh, those vintage uh, Halloween. Oh, right. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Oh. Oh, so upsetting. Uh, do we have those, Matt, the, the pictures of the, the really frightening Halloween children? Um, you guys won't see them on the Skype, but the, the, the people watching at home will see these pictures of, uh, that you've been posting. Where, where did you get these pictures, John? What was that? Where did you get these pictures? Um, I just found them online. I did a search for vintage Halloween pictures, and they're there all over the place. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And they're just like like from the 30s or something, right? They're just like yeah, like, and, they're really old pictures. And some of them are like kids with just a bag over their head with eye holes cut out, you know, or self-made masks of yeah. you know of other people or something. I don't know. Like they have masks of it looks like paper mache, but they're like masks of human faces, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so upsetting! It's like it's like the, the punch face, right? Like Mr. Punch, but like uh -huh. you know, but like like a little bit more detail, and suddenly it's oh grotesque, but. <laughs> What is it about? Like, cause like when I saw that one with the kid with the skull mask with the little hat, and it's like, and it's, he's kind of off center, and there's just like this dark grainy background, and I was like, Ugh! you know, and then and like you think about stories like like uh, so Dave Roman is uh in in and uh oh is it is it Jason Ho, uh yeah Dave Roman and Jason Ho are doing a comic called Agnes Quill, mm -hmm. uh AgnesQuill.com great comic beautiful comic everybody should go read it especially right now because it's like it's about a girl who solves mysteries with the assistance of ghosts very timely but latest page it drops kid ghost and i'm instantly like yeah yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> what is it about kids that you put them into scary stories and it instantly becomes twice as creepy well there's a there's a tradition of kids in horror too it's like a turn of the screw you guys know that story oh. uh, they did a movie about it in the I think what the '40s called The Innocents, mm -hmm. and it's yes. yeah, yes. it's all I about that movie. yeah, it's it's one of my favorite horror movies because it's all atmosphere and it's all like, are the kids haunted? Are they are they possessed? What's going on here? And it's sort of like, but the the book and the movie go back to that that question of like maybe kids are really evil. We don't want <laughs> to think about that, you know. It's like, ugh, that's gross, you know, and it's it's a. <laughs> I think it goes back to the, the unnatural thing. You know, you see a kid, they're cute, they're funny, you know, they're a little bit more innocent, and then uh, they start doing, like, yeah. these evil things or what you think is, like, evil. It, it subverts their expectations. Right, exactly. Like, there's a, there's a scene where uh, the girl in the innocence, when she's, like, by the lake with a little girl, mm -hmm. and then she looks up at the tower and she sees, like, another little kid, like... Yes talking to somebody or something like that and then she goes to to ask that kid what he was doing up there and the kid's like that he wasn't up there and that he wasn't talking to anybody and it's just kind of like Ugh. wait there's this kid up there talking to somebody and i know he was there like why what's going on you know <laughs> yeah there's also the child in danger um which uh you know the orphanage does that you have this sort of sad kid who you know who's disfigured and he wears a mask and there's something sad and lonely creepy about it which was all about atmosphere and 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 strangeness you know i also think of um the scene there's two scenes i think of the amityville horror when the little girl's talking to the character outside the window oh, right like, yeah who, who are you yeah. talking to jody I don't see anybody. There's nobody there. And then she looks and there's like red eyes or something like that, <laughs> uh, which I think actually kind of like spoiled the creepiness of that moment. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, not a horror film, but w another one of those scenes I had written down as some of the most haunting scenes that I still think about and gives me the willies is end of the Lord of the Flies. Right. With those boys chasing each other and like that final that last kid you know piggy's dead and all these other characters are dead and like the boys the, the johnny whatever his name is the leader of the bad kids is he's gonna hunt down this kid and he's gonna kill him he's mm -hmm. he's, he's gonna kill him and he's intending is like when piggy died it was kind of on purpose kind of they didn't know what they were doing but this is like they're really gonna kill him and that scene is so frightening to me and i think about it like if it would have been grown men it would have been an adventure story yeah but when it's kids, it's suddenly it's like, oh, it really gets under my skin. Um, again, I think you're, you're talking about coming back to that, um, defying our expectations, twisting our expectations a little bit, right? Right. Uh, okay, I want to talk. I want to close because we got to do book recommendations in a second. Uh, I want to close with a talk about um, building, mounting dread, and building tension. 
uh, The Shining, The Omen, you know. Uh, we've kind of hinted at this a little bit earlier, this idea of uh, a character who knows something's wrong but has no power to do anything about it, and what's more is nobody believes him. Uh, or you, you see the inevitability, like The Omen, you know when you're watching The Omen that it, it can't end well, right? Um, and there's this Hitchcock quote uh, that gets passed around. It's a YouTube video, uh, the bomb under the table thing. Have you heard of this, Eric? Oh, it looks like I just lost Skype, everybody. I lost the Skype connection altogether. <laughs> oh, no, you th you still there? I'm here. Okay, we lost right. John. But... I saw that, yeah. Okay, John's coming back. All right. Boy, Skype. There we go. <laughs> You're, you're really monkeying with me today. There we go. We're all back. Okay, so there's this Hitchcock's quote about um, the bomb under the table, and he says, like, if you tell a story, it's like people are sitting around a table, and they're talking about baseball, and then all of a sudden one of them looks under the table and says, oh, my gosh, a bomb, and they run away. Yeah. And he said, but the, the difference between building tension is, like, people are sitting around the table talking about baseball, and we show the viewer that there's a bomb under the table, and they don't know that. So yeah. Right? And then it's like the, he's, his words were, um, you get the... Uh, you got the audience working because now they're saying, stop talking about baseball. There's a bomb under the table, right? <laughs> you get them involved, right? You hold back information from the characters but give it to the viewer, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is always funny. That's what you do in a thriller, like in a spy movie too. But for some reason in a horror movie, it's really effective, you know? Um, I've also seen that like uh, in, uh, in comics. When you were talking about that, um, uh, a manga came to mind. There's like a, a manga adaption of the second Japanese ring movie, uh, no, grudge movie, Juwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's like a, there's a certain panels where this man like walks into a room and the, the shot is kind of like an, an upshot where you see like a crack in hair coming down from the ceiling. And that's the way that, that page ends. Mm -hmm. And then the next page, you see like uh, his girlfriend walking into the same room, you know, many panels, you know, just walking around, looking around, calling for the guy. And you're like, oh, man, I know what's going to happen, you know? And then the last panel is like an extreme close-up of the guy's face. You turn the page, and then it's like this big shot of, like, the, the grudge ghost with her hair, like, wrapped around his neck, you know, him hanging there, you know? Oh, and wow. just like that kind of, like, tension building up, and you know it's there, and you're just waiting for it to happen. Oh, this reminds me of something Ryan Estrada posted on Twitter a while back. It was right after the Breaking Bad finale, and he said, or right around the time of it, and I remember he's, he was kind of riding high on how good the show was, and he said, uh, you know, it's not interesting, I'm paraphrasing now, it's not interesting th to say what's going to to make the audience say what's going to happen next, right? You know, what's going to happen next? That's, that, that's a cliffhanger. That's not interesting to an audience. What's interesting to an audience is to say, what is the consequence of what just happened? Right? right? The thing happened. Now what's going to change? How are they going to deal with it? How are they going to change as a result of this thing happening? And that sounds like what you're kind of talking about there. We know it happened. We know the guy is dead. Uh, but what's going to happen when his girlfriend finds him or whatever? Right. What's right? the consequence for her walking into that room with what we know? <laughs> well, that's yeah. good. Eric, did you have any thoughts on this, this whole idea of mount, uh, building, mounting dread and building tension? Yeah, no, I just uh, it, I love that I love that Hitchcock quote and that that idea of, of uh, not you know and, and it's also it, it reminds me of sort of in movies where you don't always know if like things are really happening and that's a that's a big thing in horror is sort of like you know like going back to the orphanage again you don't know if there's supernatural things happening or if the woman is just losing her mind and that's a to me that's a really interesting device. In, in mounting tension and a really integral thing to the whole idea of horror as well. It's sort of you're building tension, but maybe there's no tension at all. The Innocents did that. It's such a, you know, and oh, and another one is uh, uh, that Nicole Kidman movie, um, The Others, which I love. Um, Have you seen the original Haunting? I think that one does it too. The original that's one. right, yeah. yeah. You don't really know what's, what's, uh, what's going on. So, I mean, you're just, you don't, the, 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 uh, I don't know if this really speaks to the, the idea of consequences, but it, it does sort of speak to the idea of you, you just you're loose in this world of not knowing. You know, you know it's it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I guess yeah, you're you're kind of painting uh, a, a more sophisticated picture of why we're afraid of the dark, right? Why are we afraid of the dark? We don't know what's in there. That's mm -hmm. that's the primal part of it. 
But if you can extend that out to say, like, I'm questioning my entire perception of reality. I'm questioning, yeah. you know, the truthfulness of people that I trust. I'm questioning whether or not this child is as innocent as she appears to be. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what unsettles us, right? And then you throw in like a scary face of ventriloquist dummy, and boom, <laughs> yeah. we've 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 un we've decoded it. We've unboxed it, and, and a splash of green. Sell it. Yeah, watch out, Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, the door. Oh yeah, she, she shut the door, Matt. It's okay. Uh, so what 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 are we doing here? Oh, okay. So I want to give you guys a chance for final thoughts. Uh, before we go into book recommendations, we're going to talk about some scary comics to read uh, on this Halloween holiday. Uh, but is there anything I didn't touch on? Uh, or is there like a one dynamite movie recommendation you give to people who are having a Halloween party? Oh, man. John? Uh... <laughs> what's, your, what's, what's your comfort food scary movie? Uh, let's go with, okay, I'll, I'll recommend three, uh, if nobody's seen them. Uh, th they're all fun, and they're all kind of spooky and scary. Uh, I'll, I'll throw in Fright Night, which is my favorite one of all time. Uh, if you're bringing friends over that uh, horror is new to them, throw in Evil Dead 2. That one always seems to work. Yeah. And uh, if you want something uh, fun and a little bit more new, go with Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah, for me, you know, I'm I'm just such a sucker for the dark, weird, gothic stuff. But my, my all-time favorite horror movie, and my one of my favorite, probably my favorite movie of all time, is uh, Bride of Frankenstein. Anything That's James Whale directed is just amazing. Um, he was just what a great mind, what a, what a great grasp he had on on the strange and the dark. So good. Um, let's see. I'd also recommend you know any of the. Uh, what any of the first three or four Christopher Lee uh, vampire movies from Hammer Horror? Love those. They're kind of gory, but the uh, the blood looks fake. Very it's, good. It, yeah, it's like bright red, <laughs> ridiculous, um, and and you know loads of fun. Um, great movies, any of those. So that those would be my recommendations. Kind of you know fifty years apart, but. Um, Bride of Frankenstein. If you've never seen it, man, you got to see it. So good. Is Bride no? Is Bride the one where it has the scientists who make the little tiny people? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did not remember that. I rewatched it recently, and I was really surprised by it. like I did not remember this whole through line with this crazy yeah. scientist who's trying to take Doctor Frankenstein's uh, research to a whole new level of making little tiny miniature people. Oh. A little ballerina. Yeah, it's great. yeah, the little king and the little queen and. And, and, yeah. and, and like the the effects are like really convincing for its time. Like it doesn't yeah. look hokey at all. It's really crazy. Yeah. yeah Bride of Frankenstein is fantastic. So yeah. okay, well now we got to do book recommendations, and we are joined by Rachel Moyer, PLA at the Ann Arbor District Library. Hey Rachel. Hey guys. Oh, let's see if your mic is on. All uh, right, just gotta get close enough. <laughs> all right, there we go. Yeah, remember remember our mic technique. So uh, how you doing, Rach? Doing pretty great. Halloween's yeah. kind of one of my favorite holidays, so looking forward to that. Yeah, what do you, what do you, you got a costume picked out? Uh, not anything too fancy. Just grabbing things from my closet. Be You're going Amelia. to Clark Kent. Oh, <laughs> that's my go-to, <laughs> but no. <laughs> Amelia Earhart this year. Oh, Nothing too spooky. oh, okay. Easy. So, so and, and you're going as sexy Amelia Earhart, right? Ooh. <laughs> I don't really want to contemplate that. That seems like it's it's built to a crescendo this year. I think everybody's finally getting a little tired of like the whole sexy mustard, sexy palace guard kind of thing. Uh, it seems like a lot of people are making fun of it this year than than they have in past years. But you know, there's so many levels to that that I yeah. just can't wrap my head around. But the <laughs> fact that you want to dress up that way when it's just cold out, just well, in Michigan, mind. yes, Ugh. in Michigan, and maybe where Eric is, uh, yeah, mm. it's a little too cold to be doing that. But uh, my arm to frostbite. But uh, where where John is in in uh, the Austin area, I'm sure you could still pull it off, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in the '80s right now, unfortunately. Yeah, but uh, anyway, so we got comics to talk about. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Eric and John, I, I said we might be uh, doing some book recommendations. You don't have to, but uh, we'll go with Rachel first in case you want to come up with something you want to recommend. So, all right, what, what comics you got, Rach? Well, um, I'll start off with The Hidden, which is Richard Sala's book. Um, starting off with that because we were talking about Frankenstein. This is kind of an interesting story in that it is sort of um, a post-apocalyptic Frankenstein story. 
and it takes the idea of Frankenstein's monster and um, puts it in the backdrop of the end of humanity. And it's a very interesting sort of story about uh, one man's pride and lack of care about humanity kind of bleeding into this creation of his and how that goes about destroying humanity. It's kind oh, of... interesting. Because like, I th isn't the original uh, Frankenstein story supposed to be about a guy who th sees himself as above humanity and wants to recreate life, and he reaches higher than he should, and he's right. punished for yep. it kind there, of thing? There's a certain degree to which his um, misanthropy has like manifests within his creation to the point where it actually like goes out and starts destroying humanity. And I might be spoiling it a little bit for you <laughs> by saying that, but it is a really fascinating tale. Um, some really lush colors I love colors the art style. There. Yeah, it's, there we go, talking about greens again, yeah, right? And, yeah. And also it like... It sounds brilliant. It is excellent. Yeah, it's really pretty. And it is in, in a creepy way. Yes. That's the best way to get me to read horror is to make it pretty because it's not my go-to <laughs> genre, but... Yeah. Uh, the second book I brought is Brian Ralph's Daybreak, which is a zombie story. However, it's really fascinating in that it, it's in the second person. So what? you are you are a player in the story, and oh wow, yeah, you don't see this very often. Yes, the other characters are interacting with you. It never actually has you saying anything. So if you are a person that's not mute, which it would work if you were mute, but you can also just sort of guess as to what you're saying based on the reactions of the people around you and it's a survival story in a zombie infested wasteland it's uh black and white pretty simple art style but very powerful and really cool kind of uh storytelling technique with the second person that does, does the second person thing work for you i mean does it make you feel like oh i'm in this yeah it's really there's a great sequence um no words whatsoever where you it has you going out alone to try and get some oh. psych pop some gas and then there's a zombies and you end up dropping your flashlight and running away and oh this is so, so creepy simple, but it's very very effective. this is so creepy you're out in like the, the the wilderness by yourself and it's just like just like the little area in front of you is lit then all of a sudden you see zombie feet in mm -hmm. the light ah yeah it uses your silence really effectively oh. Gotta check that out. so it's cool yeah this is daybreak by brian ralph who put this out Oh, what publisher was smart enough to do this book? Drawn and Quarterly. Of course it is Drawn and Quarterly. Uh, I was going to say either Drawn and Quarterly or Top Shelf would have had to do that book. Mm -hmm. So, all right. And the last things I brought with me are copies of the Eerie and Creepy Archives, which are some pretty classic horror comics from the 60s. They, if you've not read them, they're a great place to look at some uh, really great artist work. Steve Ditko, Alex Toth, Wally Wood, which I know people... Uh, who listen to your show would at least know Wally Wood from the 22 panels that always work. I'm sure that's yeah. at least <laughs> Yes. But they're really, uh, they're classic. They ha both have these characters that kind of um, are like the, the MCs of the story. There's Uncle Creepy and Uncle Eerie. And there's kind of a... Hey, guys, we're getting slapped back uh -oh. again. Uh, if you could lean back from your monitors a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> check, yeah. check, check. Still getting it, still getting it. No, nope, it's okay, gone. Thank care. you, guys. Yeah, there is anthology of short stories. I don't think any of the stories tend to be more than eight pages, uh, which leads to some really condensed storytelling. And it's also kind of got the same sort of aesthetic as Twilight Zone. It started. Uh, they both started up a few years after Twilight Zone, I believe. Mm -hmm. But there's even, I think, some crossover. I believe in this particular volume of Eerie that I brought, which is volume two, there is a adaptation of uh, Ambrose Bierce's Occur An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which I know is a pretty famous episode of The Twilight Zone. Cool. So it's got that kind of aesthetic. And the actual uh, expression of the genre is very broad in there. They, you've got stories set in like ancient Rome. You've got westerns. But they all come back to the horror. So it's yeah, cool. unsettling and unnerving. Well, which Twilight Zone did too, right? There were western mm -hmm. Twilight Zone stories. There were modern day ones and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the old EC horror comics are fantastic. They can be quite gross sometimes, though. A little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are nice, though, because they're so big, so you get a really good look at that black and white art. Yeah, sweet. The Eerie Archives and the Creepy Archives from Dark Horse Comics. All right. So, guys, do you have any book recommendations that you would throw at us? Sure. Um, oh, first of all, I completely forgot I'm wearing my Frankenstein shirt. Oh, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Boris Karloff, the best. 
Um, yeah, uh, I got these comics recently. Um, uh, they're from Dark Horse. They're the Fall of the House of Usher, and Richard Corbin did these. Oh wow! And um, yeah, they're they're pretty great. Like uh, we're talking about like atmospheric style and stuff like that. Uh, there's plenty of that in here. Um, some of my favorite panels is that like uh, he establishes that there's like fog like around the house and. Uh, there's like these panels where it just takes like the color of the fog and just uses them as like the background for a bunch of panels. And then all you see is just like the, the house, like in the foreground. So it's just like this big empty space with the color of the fog around it with the house, you know, slight. So it, it just looks really cool. I think. Um, isolation. We didn't really get to talk about that too much. Yeah. Right. Like the isolation of the mist or those kinds of stories. Right. And it it also has like uh, that uh, uh, what we call like the the hyper unnatural kind of look to it, like the people like look a little bit more gross than they should look. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like Roderick Usher has like a big nose, and his sister looks almost exactly like him, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah. Uh, those are my recommendations. House of Usher is a creepy story regardless. But right. to see it visually uh, and drawn well, oh, sold. So, yeah. yeah. So who, who put that out again? Who is the author? It, uh, it's from Dark Horse, and it's uh, Richard Corbin. Richard Corbin's House of Usher. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you got any? Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit, uh, a little bit sillier and uh, a little bit young, skew a little bit younger. Um, I'm going to say one of my favorite horror comics is Melvin Monster by John Stanley. Have you guys read this? No. I don't, I don't know if I, I have. Do you guys know who John Stanley is? Uh, no, I don't. He did, okay, he did Little Lulu in, oh, the, okay. uh, in the, what was it, 60s? For, uh, oh, you know, anyway, John and Quarterly is reproducing these, and they're beautiful hardcover editions. Uh, John Stanley also wrote for the, uh, not EC, but he wrote for competitors of EC horror. So he was writing really creepy horror co stories, but he would also do these Melvin Monster kid stories, which are, they have this great weird atmosphere that I just love. And they all take place in these sort of, uh, these weird spaces that are just sort of claustrophobic and uncertain. And they kind of come right out of, Little Lulu had a horror streak to it. If you've never read Little Lulu, she had this friend who, I can't remember her name, but she had these like staring eyes and a creepy family, and it's it's little Lulu has an awesome horror element to it. Believe it, <laughs> you know. Okay, believe it or not. And the 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 second one I want to recommend was any collection of Charles Adams' work. Those are of course single pa single panel the Adams family. These are dark, awesome, beautifully drawn. He drew, he drew them for the New Yorker um, over years. And they're just amazing. Like, you know, they're one panel cartoons that were rich and varied enough that they were able to make TV shows and movies out of. You know, they, there's so much going on. And I'm going to stretch it a bit by having my last uh, recommendation be Edward Gorey, who we've sort of, I, you know, I've sort of, he's been absorbed into comics, but I don't think that was his intent. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> It is a it is a visual narrative that that is you know very similar to comics, beautiful artwork, um, creepy, uh, disorienting, weird, funny, brilliant stuff. Um, little little almost highbrow in its uh, the way it it uh, it is intelligence. I was gonna say like the Adams stuff, the Adams family stuff seems like a more buoyant and cheerful version of gory stuff, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can say that. I would I would say that you know it's uh there it's just it's it's so silly, but uh, but there is an underlying cynicism to to it as well, which I think yeah. comes across and and that uh, yeah and 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 you have to remember Adams uh, Charles Adams was a great friend of uh, Ray Bradbury, mm. and uh, if you read Ray Bradbury's horror stuff, there's a real similarity there, to uh, Ray Bradbury used to love to write about uh, horror movie characters but in a, a mundane, normal way. Adams was doing something very similar. So, hmm. yeah, I think that's The atmosphere is very similar. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. 
Oh, cool. Well, that's a lot of stuff to follow up on. I got one more that I want to throw in. This is a web comic that you can check out today, and uh, it's been talked about in the show before, but it's timely because we're talking about you know scary stories, and the show is called Comics Are Great. I was trying to think of, are there examples of comics doing a jump scare or a startle scare? You know, Because it's harder because we've got a visual medium, right? Uh, so you can do mounting dread, you can do slow build up to things, uh, but doing the kind of thing where somebody pops up in the mirror behind you, like that Saturday Night Live skit, is kind of difficult. Um, but Mark Wade and Jeremy Rock pulled it off in uh, the Thrillbent comic, Luther. If you go to thrillbent com slash comics slash Luther, uh, it'll be in the show notes for this episode. But he does a thing because it's a web comic where... There's an actual like ah moment in the story when, when you're clicking, which is kind of cool. I was really pleasantly surprised by it, and it is a zombie story, and it's about a uh, uh, a mentally challenged guy who is dealing with the zombie apocalypse, uh, and it's it's this weird, poignant, bittersweet thing with zombies and and people trying to fight for their lives. But the comic's called Luther. It's at thrillbent.com. Uh, a really good example. Then I'd also recommend Ag Agnes Quill by Dave Roman and Jason Ho, which we talked about earlier in the show. Um, so guys, thanks so much for being a part of this discussion. Thanks for being patient with all of our technical uh, hiccups at the beginning and uh, love to have you back because, I mean, we didn't even scratch the surface of all the notes that I had for this one. Thank you, Jersey. This is always so much fun and I always come away feeling like my understanding of comics is, is so much richer after our discussions. These are so great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say. Uh, I hope I had something to do with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be back, too, and uh, nice to finally meet you, Eric. You as well, John. <laughs> sure. Talk, oh, I love like, your work. Uh, thank you. And talk about, like, uh, scary, spooky stuff. It's always fun. Well, and we should give you guys another plug. So people should go read NightmarePowerWrestling.com today, twice. Uh, pick up a copy of Ghost King, digital comic, 99 cents, but you can name your price. I recommend you go a little higher than that, but hey, 99 cents, that's that's still something. Uh, you can get it downloaded to digital tablet today. It's got a bird that swallows things and barfs up things that can be used as magical weapons. That's all you need to know. <laughs> the fifth grader and you will be happy. And then, that should be my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> that's what sold me. Like I'm reading, I'm like, this is pretty fun. Oh, that's great. Uh, Eric Orchard does a bunch of comics, which we didn't get to talk about at the top because your Skype, uh, well, we had some Skype problems, but uh, Marrow Bones, which people can get at your site. Maddie Kettle, The Adventures of the Thimble Witch is coming out from Top Shelf soon, right? Yeah. And then the big news is that, that dropped a while back was Bera, the One-Headed Troll. Yeah. I signed with uh, First Second to do that. We're working on it right now. That's a... Uh... Pretty crazy. I can't believe it. That's been a dream of mine. So, That's cool. I'm, and they are awesome to work with. This it's going to be a great comic. Uh, and you're in good company. I mean, I have yet to see anything from first second where I go, eh, I don't know about that. I mean, even if it's like a topic that I'm not interested, in, I'm like, well, I kind of got to read that now. Yeah. So, <laughs> they they are they have exquisite taste, and yeah. uh, being brought into the fold, I think, is is a wonderful acknowledgement to you as an author. Right? It's like. Absolutely. Your stuff is pretty good. So <laughs> But uh but yeah, you can find all that at ericorchard.blogspot.com, Inky Bat on Twitter. Um where else where else can we find you guys socially if people want to interact with you? If people want to see creepy pictures of kids dressed in Halloween costumes, John. <laughs> where should people follow you? Um all over Twitter, uh Tumblr, DeviantArt, John David Guerra on all of those. Yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Oh, Instagram. So, yeah. <laughs> I've fallen in love with Instagram for some reason recently, and I think it's because um, I don't have to listen to anybody's life story. <laughs> it's just, yeah. show me a picture of a neat thing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, like, there's, it's, it's more difficult to do, like, the, oh, I'm having a hard day thing. You know, it's, like, it's usually, like, pretty nice things that I get to see in the feed. Or it's of, like, oh, can you believe this? Both of which are fun to read. No pictures of frowns or anything. <laughs> <places. Yeah. laughs> now that's going to be a thing. People are going to be like, oh, sad <laughs> selfie. <laughs> uh... But okay, so then uh, Eric, are you on the Instagrams too? I think you are. I am uh, Inky Bat on the Instagrams, and I'm on the Tumblers with Bat Orchard. Bat Orchard. And, and uh, I have another one, Bat Orchard Two T O O, which is inspirational art. A lot of it very spooky. Uh, that one. Too. Yeah, and I'm I'm on the. Uh, uh, yeah, that's all I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Rachel did some stuff. Oh, we, we got we had some other things we had to promote, Rachel. I was gonna ask if you're on Instagram, but you probably don't want to say. Uh ADL's on Instagram though. We are. We're on all of the lovely social networks and you can find those linked on our site, which is AADL.org. So And then the if Twitter is the Tumblers, all that lovely stuff. Tumblr too? Oh yeah. ADL has a Tumblr. I did not know this. Mm -hmm. uh, I will have to go follow that. Uh, cause yeah, ADL posts some pretty cool stuff too, to the feeds. Um, and then there's a couple events coming up. I'll blast these real quick. This Saturday, November 2nd, Drawing Lab, Capt Capturing the Human Gesture for any artists in the area. Uh, Math Monahan, a graduate student from the UM Stamp School of Art and Design will lead a workshop and an exploration of human gesture. So if you want to do some gesture drawings, there's going to be a model. It will be clothed. Uh, you got to go to college to go to the tasteful nudity uh, gesture drawing classes. But here at the library, uh, they, you get a chance to do some gesture drawing under the guidance of somebody from the UM Stamp School of Art and Design. And then Sunday, November 3rd, the Comics Artist Forum uh, at AADL, uh, the downtown branch, fourth floor meeting room, 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, just a social gathering for local cartoonists. Get to meet and network. And then we usually have a, a, a speaker do like a 20 minute thing uh, at the top. And this time we've got Jesse Hughes, creator of Cosmic Cat, a uh, uh, longtime guest of uh, Kids Read Comics, is going to be doing a talk on expressive and facial expressions and body language. So tying in with the Saturday event. So both of those you can find at comics.aadl.org. This show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG87. And thank you once again to Eric and to John and to Rachel and to Matt and to, and to Eric Kloster in the, uh, in the control room for capturing all the stuff into the chat feed. Thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.